Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, the very thought of work can make some of us shake. Because, Lord, it just doesn't sound fun. Why do we have such a thing? Lord, today, help us to see in one, Psalm 127 how work is indeed a blessing, an opportunity to reflect the love of Jesus to those you put into our lives each day. And Lord, when work seems overbearing, help us remember who we're ultimately working for, for you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, a while back, I came across this website, I think I've mentioned it before, called Six Word Stories. The host of this website invites people to send in stories about their life, but there's one catch. You can only use six words. Here's one that I saw. Raised by lunatics, still in recovery. <laughs> or here's one that's written by a woman. Clever with numbers, not with men. Or how about this one? I thought this was very appropriate. I was born, some assembly required. So let's look at it this way. What six words might you use to describe the story of your work day? I thought of three. Bear with me. Lazy me. Thank God it's Friday. Or on the flip side, workaholic me, thank God it's Monday. This is one I hope you never use. My career, life sentence, no reprieve. The point I'm trying to make as you hear these is that for many, work, it's not always an easy place to be or all that enjoyable, even a pleasant topic. I have found that most people are living somewhere between a grudging acceptance of their workplace and an outright hate for what they do, and I don't often use that word. Several years ago, a number of surveys were taken of people in their workplace. When they were asked if there was one or more people that they just could not stand being around at work, a whopping 86% said yes. But every once in a while, you will find someone who loves their work. And not only that, they do their daily work at a level that just far exceeds any expectations of them. They literally put everything they have into working with excellence. So if you are hiring someone to work for a job of yours, how can you know that that person is going to have this inner motivation, this inner excellence to excel in the work that they do? This is where Psalm 127 comes into play. The author of that psalm was Solomon, the wise guy of the Old Testament. And he wants to give you maybe a new perspective on what work is all about. He'd like you to look at work from a fresh different angle, because there can be so much more to work than I think we sometimes think about. So let's start with the first two verses of Psalm 127. I'd like to highlight these words. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. I think this verse clearly shows the importance of bringing the Lord into your work, whether you have an active job or are retired or somewhere in between. Now, in these verses, he mentions two jobs. One is home building. The other one is being a watchman. Now, there is no reason the Lord could not have said, well, unless the Lord takes care of the numbers, the CPA will work in vain, or unless the Lord takes care of the patient, the nurse will work in vain. The point is this, regardless of what type of work, vocation, or calling that God has put you into, you are invited by God to take the Lord right into the workplace. The psalmist continues, in vain you rise early and stay up late, 
toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those whom he loves. So often that I have seen where the workplace can become a drudgery, or even an all-out nightmare, because we go to work and forget to take the Lord with us. We somehow will say, okay, the Lord applies to the spiritual side of my life, but I just don't see how he fits into the work part. But for King Solomon, though, any talk about work begins with the Lord. And if you haven't noticed, I mentioned the children's message, God is quite a worker. Think about how God the Father created all things in six days, and then he rested on day number seven. Think of Jesus and his work. His assignment, beyond just being a carpenter, was to literally work out your salvation and your hope for eternity. And he did it in full. Remember his words from the cross? Three words. It is finished. All sin, all brokenness has been paid for. In fact, we know that he rose again to everlasting life. For you, God is a worker. God, the Holy Spirit, is working hard in each of your lives this very moment. He builds your faith so that it shows through to others through the work that you do for them and for Him. But really, Solomon's point here in Psalm 127 is so simple. When you leave God out of work, you're going to be frustrated. It can seem empty. You wonder, well, what's the purpose? Where's the fulfillment? There will likely be complaining, dissatisfaction. Relationships and work can become very strained because you just don't take God along with you. Now, as I mentioned, it helps to remember that work has been part of our story since the very beginning of time. God put Adam and Eve to work right away. They didn't just meander around the garden going, what do we do next? They took care of it. And as I mentioned, they even had fun coming up with creative names for the animals. I never would have thought of mongoose. It was only when sin came into the picture that work all of a sudden became toil. God himself said it. You will work by the sweat of your brow. From that point on, work became challenging. It was anything but easy. And it's kind of been that way ever since. Work, because of sin, can become a great challenge in our lives. Now in the Bible, there are two specific sins that are tied to work, and they're polar opposites. The first one is laziness. I love that picture. Which implies that the ideal place to be in life is to do absolutely nothing. If you want to call it work, it makes you a professional couch potato. Now laziness can show up in our work. This guy's job, his one job, is to paint a straight line. But oh no, there's a branch in the way. Well, get out of the truck and move it. Then you can continue painting your straight line. So how within the work you do, whatever it looks like, your calling, your vocation in life, look like that, because maybe you chose not to do excellent work by not bringing the Lord with you and working for Him as well. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, Paul boldly tells followers of Jesus that if you're not going to work, but just, I'm just going to hang around and wait for Jesus to return in glory, well, then you shouldn't eat either. Paul calls out laziness. Eugene Peterson talks about this in one of his books. Interesting contrast here. <clears throat> in Eastern cultures, the height of spiritual ecstasy, or your ultimate goal in life, is to do absolutely nothing. It's the ideal state of being, to exert no energy. But is that all that it's cracked up to be? Most of us, I would think, have at least some desire 
to be productive. But as I said, in Western culture, it can be the very opposite. Sometimes, and I know I've been guilty of this more than a few times, we turn work into an idol. Our work defines us. If we lose our job, we don't remember or know who we really are. Our job is directly tied into our identity. We give up our time with our families because we're so committed to working. Now, turning your work into idolatry is another sin the Bible clearly calls down. Because when you do that, when your work instead becomes all about you and about what you bring to the table, what promotions, what benefits you have earned, it can become an idol in itself. You then find yourself in that situation described in verse 2 from earlier, of rising early, staying up late, and toiling for food to eat. And many of you who know me know I tend to be on this end. I'm a workaholic, and I admit it. You long for those few restful hours of sleep that God might give to you. Today, Solomon encourages you to bring God to your work because the Lord brings meaning and purpose to your work. Now, some of us are like this. For those of you who can't see, it's a guy in a hospital gown in the hospital under the bed fixing his hospital bed. <laughs> We just have to find ways to do, 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 instead of depending on the Lord, trusting in the strength and the hope that He provides, and taking the time we need to get well when we find ourselves down. So what lessons can we learn from Psalm 127? There are several, but the greatest is this. Who do we ultimately work for? Ultimately, it's the Lord. The Spirit can lead you to recast your vision and motivation for working. When I go to work, I go to work for the Lord. It's the Lord who I ultimately serve here. And that can actually help combat any feelings of emptiness. If you just can't stand that person you work for, remind yourself, you work for the Lord. He's not just the Lord of a spiritual life portion of your life. He's also the Lord of your work life. And second, if you work for the Lord, you strive for excellence. If he is your supervisor and leader, he leads you to do all things well. Remember what was said of Jesus? He does all things well. Now, I know we're not Jesus. But we do strive for excellence in the workplace because the one to whom we are accountable is excellent in all things. You were created to be excellent in all things. You're not a mistake. You're not only halfway there. Now, I know that laziness and sin get in the way. We're just not perfect people. We struggle in weakness every day of our lives. But we have a Savior who forgives that laziness and weakness as we literally lay at His feet. He loves you, and He leads you to be an excellent worker, to the best of the ability He has given each of you, even as God Himself is excellent. Martin Luther actually put it like this, interesting quote, the maid who sweeps her floor in the kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps the floor, here's where I like it, but because God loves clean floors. So whatever vocation or skill God has called you individually to, be it an accountant, maintenance worker, retiree, CEO, police officer, teacher, or that very important vocation of mother and father. God blesses it. He leads you to excellence. And with God as your supervisor, I don't like the word boss, you strive to do your best at home, at work, or school. You want to be the best follower of Jesus that he leads you to be. 
So we take the work of God to our daily work. So what is this work of God I'm talking about? It's how you reflect his love to others. Kindness, compassion, serving. It doesn't look like you got up this morning and ate nails for breakfast. Instead, you care about the people who you work with and for. The Lord is leading you to build a caring relationship with the people that he puts into your life. In this Psalm 127, Solomon focuses on the power of relationships. That means finding that balance between faith and work and family. I know that's hard for some. I see many of our families and marriages being stretched to the edge because of work commitments. But even as we find that balance between career, family, wealth, and love, we see in Jesus how all of those demands can be met. Jesus himself knew the significance of getting the right balance between work and family. He knows how much we struggle with this, and he provides his help and support. Think for a moment about what his work was. Bringing us forgiveness and life at a very high cost to himself. Living the perfect life you and I couldn't live. Taking the hard journey to the cross. An instrument of torture. Dying there, not for anything he had done, but for you. For me. Proving that death would not have the final say for him or for us, rising from the dead. Jesus lived a packed last two and a half years of his life, filled with work. But it was all about that relationship that he builds with you. You are the ultimate reason that he did this. His focus was a relationship of unconditional love that makes you his child forever. He blended work and relationships in a way that only God can. So Jesus has redeemed you, not just for now, not just for the work that you're doing, the kind of person you will be. He's redeemed you for an eternity. I really think that changes our focus on what work is. May the Lord bless you in your workplace, at home, whatever it is, as he calls you to be his child as you strive for excellence and reflect that excellence in the work that he is doing in your life and as you make a difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith of your Lord Jesus. Amen.